Hello everyone and welcome to the second lecture in the topic of chamber enlargement in the ACG course and our lecture today is titled ventricular enlargement which is a continuation to the first lecture of atrial enlargement. In this lecture today we are going to focus on the ventricular enlargement and so our ILOs are to understand how to detect and diagnose LVH and RVH in ACG and how to diagnose a secondary polarization abnormality or which is famously called as a strain pattern. And needless to say, to check for ventricular hypertrophy, we are going to focus today on the complex itself because of course the complex represents ventricular depolarization and we are not going to focus on any other wavelets in the ECG. Of course, and the first thing that we need to start our lecture with is the normal parameters of the complex which are the morphology, duration, amplitude, and axis. And we know that the normal duration of a complex should be less than 120 milliseconds. And of course, we explain the issue of the axis in the lecture of ACG axis. But today, we are going to focus on morphology and amplitude in order to diagnose LVH and RVH. And in order to understand this, we need to see this illustration diagram for the normal ventricular depolarization. We can see here from your right hand side the left ventricular free wall, interventricular septum, and right ventricular free wall. We can see the left bundle branch in the left ventricle and right bundle branch in the right ventricle. And we can see the six chest leads from V1 to V6. The first process in the normal ventricular depolarization is the septal depolarization, which normally goes from left to right direction. And so in V1, it would lead to small positive deflection because it is directed towards the positive pole of V1, and it will lead to a small negative deflection in V6 because it is directed away from the positive pole of V6. Then the ventricular depolarization takes place in the left ventricular free wall and right ventricular free wall. And because, of course, the left ventricle has much more larger thickness than the RV wall, the left ventricular depolarization predominates the right ventricular depolarization. This leads to the much thicker arrows that we can see here is animating. And so it will lead to large negative deflection in V1 because it's away from the positive pole of V1 and large positive deflection in V6 and from V2 to V5 would be midway between V1 and V6. So we can see here that the ventricular depolarization ranges from V1 to V6 in order to see this normal R wave progression and this explains this normal ECG pattern in chest leads. Now we are going to start with the abnormal features. We understood the normal ventricular depolarization and the normal R wave progression and why the complex morphology seems this pattern in V1 and V6 and the midway in the chest leads between them. But what if the left ventricular wall is much thicker than normal leading to left ventricular hypertrophy? At that time, septal depolarization would be the same, but left ventricular depolarization would be much, much more exaggerated leading to accentuation of the negative component in V1 and accentuation of the positive component in V6 and of course the other chest leads in between them would be also accentuated regarding their amplitude and so the septal depolarization would remain the same so the small R wave in V1 and the small initial Q wave in V6 would remain the same because septal depolarization is not affected except if there is also septal hypertrophy with it. But in most of the cases, the affection in, in the deep S wave in V1 and large, S, large R wave in V6. So what can we notice here, for example, in this ECG? I can see that there is a deep S wave of about 13 millimeter and a tall R wave in V5, which is about 25 millimeter. If I calculate the sum of S wave in V1 and R wave in V6, it would be 38 millimeter, which is a large number exceeding 35 millimeter. So regarding left ventricular hypertrophy, which is defined as increase in LV wall thickness, there are many ECG features that we can use in order to diagnose it on the surface ECG. The first thing in the ECG is a Socolo line index, which depends on the sum of S wave and sum of R wave, as we are going to explain shortly. There is the R wave amplitude in AVL, there is the coronal voltage criteria, and there is a less important item called coronal voltage duration product, which you are not going to explain a lot today because it is complicated to calculate in the ECG. Let's start with the Socolo line index. Socolo like index depends on the sum of S wave in V1 or V2 plus the 
R wave in V5 or V6. And if the sum is more than 35 millimeters, this is a cutoff point for diagnosis left ventricular hypertrophy in ACG. So, so cold line index more than 35 millimeter is one of the ACG features to diagnose left ventricular hypertrophy. And this is the same ACG that we have seen before regarding the sum of S wave and R wave. Then we are going to move to the R wave amplitude in EVL, and it is much more simple. If just the R wave amplitude in EVL is more than 11 millimeters, this is one of the ACG features to diagnose left ventricular hypertrophy. Then the coronal voltage criteria, it depends on the sum of S wave in V3 plus the sum of R wave in AVL. If it is more than 28 millimeter in males or more than 20 millimeter in females, this is a diagnostic ECG feature for left ventricular hypertrophy. So here it combines the S wave of a precordial lead with the R wave of a limb lead. So it is different from the Socolo line index. And this is the, here this pattern that we sum the R wave of AVL with the S wave of V3. The last one is a coronal voltage criteria, but we are not going to uh, coronal voltage product, but we are not going to pay attention to it. But there is a question that may be raised in our mind at the time being after we explain this. Do you notice that left ventricular hypertrophy in ECG seems like an exaggeration of normal ECG? Of course, yes, because as we know, left ventricular wall thickness is much more than RV wall thickness. And this explains why the ventricular free wall depolarization, which was directed away from V1 and towards a possible V6, because left ventricular depolarization predominates right ventricular depolarization. So if left ventricle is much more thicker, just you are exaggerating the normal pattern. Now the coronal voltage duration product is just the product of the QRS duration and the coronal product or the coronal voltage of the 12 lead sum of a QRS voltage. But of course it is a complicated item that I don't advise to use in the surface ECG. So we are going to use uh, the first three features. There are also other additional ECG features suggesting LVH like the R wave in EVF, S wave in EVR, R wave in V4, V5, V6, sometimes ST elevation in right precordial leads. But my advice just stick to these three features for left ventricular hypertrophy so call like index, R wave in AVL, and coronal voltage criteria. So, for example, here we can see that the sum of S wave in V1 and the R wave in V6, of course, would exceed 35 millimeter by a large value, and so it can be used here to diagnose left ventricular hypertrophy. What are the other ECG features that you expect to see in patients with left ventricular hypertrophy? I expect to see left atrial enlargement, for example, if the diastolic function of the left ventricle is impaired because of LVH, left atrial volume would be increased, and so it would be reflected in the, on the ECG as left atrial enlargement, which is sometimes called the P-mitral, and as we mentioned in the first lecture, it is an increase in the P-wave duration, and we explained why. We expect to see left axis deviation, so I expect the axis of the heart to be between, for example, minus 30 degree to minus 90 degree. I expect to see some increase in the complex duration because, of course, ventricular depolarization would be slightly impaired in the presence of left ventricular hypertrophy because, of course, as we know, left ventricular hypertrophy is a pathology caused by the pressure overload on the left ventricle that lead to increase in wall thickness, and this, of course, would lead to impairment in the ventricular depolarization. Oh, and of course, we would see an increase in the R wave peak time, which is the time interval between the start of R wave to the peak, especially in V5 and V6, I could see an increase of more than 50 milliseconds. And of course, we would see sometimes secondary repolarization abnormalities, which is called LV strip pattern, which we are going to explain at the end of this lecture in the form of ST depression and T wave inversion. So these are the additional ECG features that I expect that I may see with the patient with left ventricular hypertrophy. So here, for example, we could see the T-wave inversion in V5 and V6, which is explained by the strain pattern accompanying left ventricular hypertrophy. What are the famous causes of left ventricular hypertrophy, for example? Of course, the most common cause is a hypertension when it is not controlled, at least to pressure overload on the left ventricle leading to left ventricular hypertrophy. Aortic stenosis is also one of the famous causes. Coarctation of aorta, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and sometimes the physiological condition of athlete's heart may lead to LVH on the ECG, but it is a physiological adaptation of the heart of athletes.
So that's it for the left ventricular hypertrophy. Now let's move to the right ventricular hypertrophy and we would use the same diagram for normal ventricular depolarization. We explained before the septal depolarization from left to right and the left ventricular depolarization which predominates the right ventricular, right ventricular depolarization. But here the change that there is an increase in the RV wall thickness so there is left right ventricular hypertrophy mostly due to pressure overloads on the right ventricle so sometimes I think that here the upper hand would not be with the left ventricle as in normal condition but it may be with the right ventricle and so I can expect here in the precordial lead that this pattern would be changed so I could expect that I may see tall R wave in V1, in V2 and even in V3, V4 and so the R wave progression pattern and the normal pattern would be reversed because here the free wall ventricular depolarization would be directed towards the positive pole of V1 because of the right ventricular hypertrophy and so I could expect tall R wave in V1 in this case so this explains the pattern in right ventricular hypertrophy so for example what can we notice in this ECG I could notice that there is right axis deviation and there is as well tall R wave in V1 and V2 so this can be diagnostic for right ventricular hypertrophy so here for example we could see a normal ECG and we could see right ventricular hypertrophy we can notice that the R wave was normally small in V1 and V2 because RV as we know doesn't have a lot of muscle mass in comparison to the left ventricle but in presence of left ventricular hypertrophy we could see here on the right hand image that the R wave is tall in V1 and V2 and is differentiate normal ECG from RVH so in order to understand and to have like a solid rules in between us we need to have criteria for diagnosis of right ventricular hypertrophy as we used in the left ventricular hypertrophy so the criteria is right axis deviation of, of more than 110 degrees, dominant R wave in V1 more than 7 mm tall, and the call line voltage criteria of R wave, the sum of R wave in V1 and S wave in V5. So let's, for example, start with the right axis deviation. Remember, of course, this slide from the ACG axis lecture. Here we know, of course, that if lead 1 is ne predominantly negative, so the axis is directed away from the positive pole of lead 1, then lead 2 is positive so it is directed towards its positive pole, lead EVF is positive so it is directed towards its positive pole, so we can expect that the ECG axis of ventricular depolarization is directed towards the right uh, lower quadrant and so there is right axis deviation and this of course is expected in patient with RVH. And as well, we would see dominant R wave in V1 of more than 7 mm amplitude. So if I find tall R wave more than 7 mm in V1, this is one of the ECG features of RVH in ECG. And the Sokol line voltage criteria is the sum of R wave in V1 plus the sum of S wave in V5. If it exceeds 10.5 mm, this also is one of the ECG criteria for RVH. So, the so call line voltage also is used in RVH, which depend on the amplitude of R wave in V1 and the amplitude of S wave in V5. Here, for example, we could see that this patient in his ACG, he has right axis deviation represented by the predominantly positive complex in lead AVF and the predominantly negative complex in lead 1. And we can see a tall R wave in V1, which exceeds, of course, 7 mm. And here, the same question which rise in our minds in LVH would rise again that here RVH is simply reversal of the normal complex morphology in precordial leads. So if LVH was an exaggeration of the normal pattern, RVH is reversal of the normal pattern of complex morphology in precordial leads. Now we need to know what are the other ECG features that you expect to be present with RVH. Of course, I expect right atrial enlargement or what we call P-palmonel, in which there is an increase in the P-wave amplitude more than 2.5 mm in limb leads and more than 1.5 mm in chest leads. I, of course, expect right axis deviation, which is one of the ECG features of RVH. I expect to see incomplete or complete right bundle branch block in most of the cases and I expect of course secondary repolarization abnormalities which we call RV strain pattern in the form of ST depression and T-wave inversions in V1 and V3. Now we need to 
have other examples of ECG. Here, for example, we could see that the patient has tall R wave in V1, more than 7 millimeter. We could see that the patient have nearly right axis deviation represented by the predominantly positive complex in lead AVF and in lead 2 it is biphasic and it is negative in lead 1 and of course we could see here in these spread circles that there are T wave and inversion and ST depression in V1 to V3 which is caused by the RV strain pattern and what are the famous causes of RVH that I should expect if I diagnose right ventricular hypertrophy from the ECG I expect pulmonary hypertension Congenital heart disease, for example, primary stenosis and tetralogy of fallow, which leads to pressure overload, of course, on the right ventricle due to outflow tract obstruction, and arrhythmogenic RV cardiomyopathy, which is one of the structural heart disease affecting predominantly the right ventricle. Now we are going to speak about the strain pattern, which sometimes accompany LVH or RVH. As we know, hypertrophy is a pathological process as a response to pressure overload on the ventricle, and so it adversely affects the the depolarization of the ventricle, which is manifested as mild increase in the complex duration, sometimes it may lead to bundle branch block, and it affects the repolarization, leading to secondary abnormalities in the ST segment and the T wave. And so we have these two terminologies which are used interchangeably strain pattern or secondary repolarization abnormalities. For me, I prefer this term secondary repolarization abnormalities because it describes the nature of these ECG features, but of course, the strain pattern is a very common term that's still used so far. So, let's start with the left ventricular hypertrophy, the secondary repolarization abnormalities accompanying them or the LVH strain pattern. We expect secondary T wave inversion and ST depression in the left sided leads. So, I could see ST depression tube inversion in V5, V6, plus minus 1 on EVL, and these leads, of course, as descri are described as the lateral leads, which look specifically at the left ventricle. And with right ventricular hypertrophy, we expect secondary tube inversion ST depression in V1, V2, V3, plus minus, of course, inferior leads. So the strain pattern in LVH is usually in the left sided leads or the lateral leads, and the strain pattern accompanying RVH is usually in the right precordial leads plus minus the inferior leads. So for example here I could see that there is T wave inversion in lead 1, lead EVL, in lead V5 and V6 and of course there are voltage criteria of LVH as represented by the Sokolo line index and the total R wave in AVL so I could see that this patient has voltage criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy plus secondary repolarization abnormalities and also in the other example I could see here for example that this patient has tall R wave in V1 and so it is diagnostic for right ventricular hypertrophy plus a right axis deviation and there is T wave inversion ST depression in lead 2, 3, AVF and also in from, just leads from V1 to V4 so this patient has right ventricular hypertrophy and also he has RV strain pattern. So remember, of course, the same rule that we use in the atrial enlargement, that ECG is an initial test that suggests chamber enlargement, but of course you need transthoracic echocardiography to confirm this finding. So for example, if you diagnose left ventricular hypertrophy in the ECG, you need to have an echo to measure the LV wall thickness and LV mass index, and you need to measure the RV wall thickness if you diagnose RVH in the ECG. So, at the end of our lecture, now we understand how to detect and diagnose RVH and LVH in ECG, and we understand how to detect LV and RV strain pattern or the secondary repolarization abnormalities. And of course, our take home message today that LVH is considered an exaggeration of the normal R wave progression in precordial leads, and so you could expect its voltage criteria, but you need to know the numbers, of course, for the cutoff point for the so called like index and the R wave in AVL and the coronal voltage criteria. And RVH is a reversal of the normal R wave progression in precordial leads and of course you need to remember the cutoff points for the numbers also for the Sokolo line index for the RVH and the presence of tall R wave in lead V1 more than 7 millimeter. Thank you very much for your listening.